we knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Hey, did you see that city where the first atomic bomb was dropped? Yes, Fred. We flew over Hiroshima for about half an hour. It was a shambles, huh? A shambles? It looked like Ebbets Field after a double header with the Giants. One of history's most drastic political, moral, and economic wars. A cold war. Now when you take one sip, you won't need any more. Nuclear blindness. All he can see is a mushroom cloud. Boom. Atomic cocktail. In the event of a global catastrophe, it may fall to you, citizen, to adjust to a strange new world. One where you are the master of your own fate. Should disaster strike in the form of an atomic blast, or for a totally off-topic example, a global pandemic, the world you find yourself in may be filled with new dangers and new challenges. Challenges such as learning to cut your own hair. Meet our friend Kyle. Kyle is quarantining himself because he lives during a pandemic. Anyone he meets could be a potential carrier for disease, and without knowing it, he could have the disease himself. So Kyle is doing the responsible thing and avoiding human contact. It's remarkably easy for him. He's had plenty of practice. But whoa there, Tarzan! Looks like you've let yourself get shaggy and unfillable. Better take a razor to that scraggly mess. That means it's time to get a haircut. But without the ability to pay someone from the lower classes to do it for you, the only possible course of action is to do it yourself. Certainly makes more sense than protesting to get a haircut. Wait, is the protest and get a haircut thing more of a quarantine season one joke? Whatever, I need a haircut anyway and I've already bought the Fallout costume so we've sunk cost into this bit. Does anyone even still play Fallout anymore? Did that weird multiplayer West Virginia thing ruin it for everyone? And apparently Microsoft just bought Bethesda for $7.5 billion because there's only going to be one company in the future. But anyway, to get started on your haircut, first, you need the right equipment. Before you start, gather one electric razor, a pair of scissors, one comb, one small handheld mirror, and a mask, just in case. First, wet your hair and towel dry. Find your natural part and separate the hair from the top of the head. Take your electric razor and starting at the temples, trim the sides of your head. You may experience immediate regrets. Using the small mirror, look at the back of your head and trim. You may have trouble doing this yourself. You may lack the hand-eye coordination to pull off detailed grooming work. You may struggle to use the mirror to see what the hell you're doing. That's okay. Struggle is an inherent part of existence. Using the comb, draw your hair up into a section. Use the scissors to remove the ends of your hair. Repeat, moving back along the top of your head until you are presentable. While grooming, it may be necessary to block the camera lens with your arms, as setting up a new angle would take energy that you may not have due to ongoing depression. Forget what you wrote down in your script and just kind of wing it for a while. No one's going to see this haircut anyway. Who cares? Apply shaving cream to your face and shave your beard as you would normally do. I shouldn't have to tell you how to do this. Once you've wiped your face clean with the towel, take a second to look at your newly clean American face in the mirror.
take a moment to wonder how you got to this point. Yes, you too may wonder why the government has abandoned you in a time of crisis. Why everything has to be done on your own. Why even simple things like personal grooming feel difficult in a time of crisis. Why nowadays it always seems like a time of crisis. Why every day feels like a crisis, even when you keep hearing about new crises on a daily basis. Why isn't the plural of crisis crises? Why does it sound weird? Could it be that we're designed to think about only one crisis at a time, and so more than one crisis seems inhuman and wrong, and makes you wonder how in the name of all that is good and holy I'm still alive to witness each new daily horror? On the steps of the nation's capital, the bell announcing the opening of Mental Health Week. If you ask me, I think it's because of those atom bombs. Yeah? Yeah. They've done some cockeyed things to the world. I think they've knocked us south of the equator. Never before have so many known so little about a subject so big and so important. Characterizing mental health as the nation's number one problem, the vice president says that the ringing of the bell throughout the nation will be a reminder of suffering Americans. Is suffering from a dread disease called nucleurosis. The Atomic Cafe is one of the best edited documentaries I've ever seen. Without narration, without anything more than an opening title card and labels for certain clips, the film does what documentary film does best. Take primary sources and tell the truth. The real truth. The truth that the people who created these clips were trying to distract from. And yes, Bert the Turtle will make an appearance. This movie features Bert the Turtle. We will totally talk about the absolute legend that is Bert the Turtle. And yes, the Atomic Cafe was an actual cafe. And because the internet will eat me if I don't reference Mad Max, the Atomic Cafe is also in Beyond Thunderdome. I'm guessing George Miller has seen this movie. The 1982 doc sifts through reels and reels of footage from actual U.S. propaganda from 1945 to about 1960 or so, and tells the narrative of how the atomic bomb struck the American psyche and left a cultural fallout. And yes, if it looks at all familiar, it's probably because the aesthetic cultivated by this documentary was used as the basis for the Fallout video game franchise. And that is why I'm cosplaying, because... Something to do, I don't know. Quarantine vault, one wooden jumpsuit. I got Coke in a glass bottle that I'm gonna pretend is Nuka Cola. And I got um bobbleheads. Uh got this one. Um I, I swear to god it came like this. You yeah, that video game franchise whose brand is built entirely on juxtaposing cheerful Atomic Age pop culture and the harrowing effects of the Atomic Age could actually unleash on society, was not Bethesda's idea. No, it wasn't even Interplay Media's idea. Credit should go to Jane Loader and the brothers Kevin and Pierce Rafferty, who did the hard work of gathering primary sources, finding an overarching narrative within those sources, and making a portrait of a moment in time. A terrifying era, when the government kept making increasingly inhumane decisions, when a populace was left in ignorance about the true horror of it all, and any attempt to ask for a better world was met with useless noise about simply being grateful that you had the right to ask. Only communist countries can guarantee you peace! Why don't you go live in a communist country then? Yeah, the 1940s had these guys too. You look pretty well off, sister, to be tearing down the country that gives you freedom of speech. Culture war. Culture war never changes. I know the Fallout franchise has gotten bad in recent years, but even despite the many story issues, gameplay issues, graphics issues, developer issues, multiplayer issues, and issues issues that the games have had over the years, I still think the world of Fallout has plenty of cultural resonance that the games have never fully explored. For example, did you know that Overseer was the title given to workers who oversaw a plantation slave population? Does Bethesda know? Oh god, what would they do if they did know? But the games do comment heavily on the naivete of the early atomic age, primarily through its jazzy mid-20th century soundtrack. I'll completely admit that a big part of why I kept coming back to the Fallout games has been the soundtrack. Something about scavenging for ammunition and avoiding super mutants while listening to Billie Holiday is pretty relaxing, gotta say. 
And hey, if they get some gamer into Cole Porter, then all the better, right? This soundtrack Bethesda got does a lot of heavy lifting for the game's atmosphere. And it ties it back to the real world. Atom bomb baby, boy she can start. One of those chain reactions in my heart. This song, which appears on the Atomic Cafe's official soundtrack, would later be used in Fallout 4. The song dates to 1956, a full decade after America used atomic weapons on civilian populations, but it received renewed attention in the 80s when it was used in this dock. The film came out in a time when nuclear tensions were again heating up, thanks to the Reagan administration's departure from a policy of containment and towards a more aggressive anti-Soviet stance, promoting nuclear buildup and, once again, threatening to turn the Cold War hot. So this documentary was quite topical at the time. The Atomic Cafe is an unusual documentary created entirely from propaganda film and newsreels of the 1940s and 50s. As it is topical now. How did you get interested in this project? Well, we uh, discovered some years ago in San Francisco this book called 3,433 U.S. Government Films. We started to realize there was a whole wealth of this material out there that no one had ever really assembled into one package and set out to do a film which dealt with propaganda only and then Evolved into, it evolved into something on the A-bomb when we saw all the uh, material that was on that subject. It's my atomic love for you. The story the filmmakers discovered was one of normalization, of being faced with the horror of a crime against humanity committed during a war, and then the establishment of a new American-led peace. The film tells history through montage, like here, Shots of men marching, then women marching, then a wedding ceremony. All to illustrate the explosion of new families started after the end of the war, when stability and prosperity became the new normal. A creative way to show the baby boom. But the film's real power comes from its oral history, from its official interviews from people who were actually there. Again, routine. There were, we were bothered uh, not in the least by any kind of fighter opposition. The voice you hear uh, is no Paul flag. Tibbetts, uh, the pilot who flew the Enola Gay, the man who actually released the bomb. His interview starts the film. The bomb blast hit us. It hit us in uh, two different shock waves, uh, the first being the stronger. This... Uh, as I say, was a uh, perfectly uh, unexciting and routine thing up until the point of taking a look at the damage that had been done. This is disturbing footage, so be warned. I'll need to show the actual victims of atomic blasts to make a point. They were definitely military targets, there was no question about that. And they offered such a, uh, well, you could almost say a, a, a classroom experiment as far as being able to determine later the bomb damage. I have uh, been subjected many times to uh, criticism. Tibbetts isn't great at expressing his emotions. Uh, I have been accused of being uh, uh, insane, being a drunkard, uh, being everything that uh, you can imagine a derelict to be. Uh, as a result of a guilty conscience for doing this. As I, and as I say, uh, no one's ever come to my defense in, in that regard. Which sets the tone for a lot of interview footage that follows. Square-jawed white men suppressing emotions before giving a sober speech about awesome responsibility. We have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history. And we have won. Throughout these speeches, and there are many, you hear the language of caution, of sobriety, of respect for the awesome responsibility of having a world-ending bomb. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us, instead of to our enemies. Immediately undermined by other elected officials saying that, no, we should use the bomb a lot. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable James E. Van Zandt. United States Congressman from Pennsylvania. We should use the atomic bomb, not only on Korea, uh, but north of the Yalu River in Manchuria. And the pattern is set. Would the atom bomb be the answer to the Chinese hordes? President Truman said that it was under consideration. Only one thing that will stop them, and they're a ferocious fun. If General McCarthy... 
the drops of atomic bomb. Remember, these are all primary documents. This was not made for the film. This was discovered. The filmmakers actually found country folk songs about how awesome it would be if Douglas MacArthur genocided everyone north of the 38th parallel. There'll be fire just in the middle, flying all around, and the radioactivity will burn him to the ground. If there's any commies left, they'll be all on the run. How is this song not in a Fallout game, right? Hard to forget the two times America used atom bombs against civilian targets. Easy to forget the number of times we wanted to and didn't. This is the destructive power we pray God we will never be called upon to hurl at any nation. But should it become necessary... I'm sure you can see the influence. Following total atomic annihilation, the rebuilding of this great nation of ours may fall to you. That's why This pandemic had me thinking about the Fallout games a lot. Not necessarily because of the whole, you know, end of the world thing, but because of the game's emphasis on exploration. You know, it felt like an open world. I just kind of like made it a game in my head, you know? There are all these new rules you had to follow, you know, new things you had to wear before you go outside. And and the first things I think about when I think about that are like, you know, Fallout games with the emphasis on, you know, exploring an area and getting to know like where the rest stops are. Um, I actually spent a lot of time uh, in the first months of quarantine just outside. Um, you know, socially distancing, wearing a mask, all that, but going outside looking for parks that I could, you know, rest in and just exploring the area. Again, avoiding people, which is uh, easy. Uh, I'm in Woodside in Queens, which in the early days was uh, one of the uh, epicenters of COVID-19 outbreaks in the U.S. I live like half a mile from a hospital. Um, But yeah, I spent a lot of time looking for um, parks. Just places where people could go and everywhere was so quiet. <laughs> Middle New York City and it was so quiet. Except for the sirens. Split the atom itself is a terrifying phrase, put into etymological context. In Greek, atomos means unsplittable, indivisible. So split the atom means split the unsplittable. Nuclear comes from the Latin nucleus, as in the kernel of a nut, which in scientific circles came to mean a single, indivisible thing. Nucleus dates to the early 1700s, when it was used to describe the nucleus of a comet. Again, the core, central thing. Ernest Rutherford first used the word to describe the central part of an atom in 1911, the nucleus being the part of the atom that is split when the fission reaction that creates an atomic explosion. So a nuclear family, then, would be a family unit that forms a core, unbreakable structure of society. The OED's oldest citation is from 1925, so it predates the atomic age. But damn if the term nuclear family didn't acquire a whole new meaning. Now listen, kids. If they're dropping an atomic bomb, it may go off any second now. Whatever happens, I'll give the signal when it's all right for us to get up. It's important to remember that all of this footage was made for mass audiences. These films were made to quickly and broadly disseminate information about this new, strange thing called the bomb. Explaining concepts that had previously been confined to the realm of hard sciences. Radioactivity, nuclear fission, radiation poisoning. And in this flurry of new words, you can see the reinforcement of older ideas, of patriarchy. We should rely on the best prudential judgment that the father, or the one responsible for the shelter, can make in the circumstances. Here you can see the roots of American Christian fundamentalism, adding to the stories that the end times are near, and that a great battle is coming, as foretold in the book of Revelation. Everybody's worried yeah. about the atomic bomb. But nobody's worried, no, about the day my lord will come, when he'll hit great God almighty like an atom bomb. You can see here how the bomb becomes blessed, 
as part of God's plan for America. And God did bless America with the greatest weapon in the world. Well, I guess there's nothing for us to worry about. We're the ones that have the bomb. And if God has blessed America, see how easy then it is to make the atheists in the Soviet Union into a new enemy. Hence the creation of the evil empire. I'm no communist, and I'll tell you that right now. I believe a man should own his own house and car and cow. I like this private ownership, and I want to be left alone. Let the government run its business, and let me run my own. Through primary sources, the filmmakers show us the start of the new Red Scare. And by primary sources, I mean official government footage and... This song is real. A cheerful country song about the House on American Activities Committee. And Congress has appointed a committee, so they said, to find out who's American and who's a low-down red. Also inexplicably real is this propaganda film supposedly showing what happens when Soviet-style communism takes over an American small town. The small town of Mawsonee, Wisconsin. Peaceful, isn't it? But the red truncheon falls and the chief of police is hustled off to jail. I shouldn't have to tell you this is all staged. Watch carefully what happens to an editor who operates under a free press. He goes to jail too and his newspaper is confiscated. Exit freedom of thought. Culture war never changes. Fortunately, we can move the clock back. The time is not yet. And let us pray that it never happens in our country. Before we meet the members of the American Legion Post okay, I need to let 79 the who help make this picture is, uh, possible, I'd just like something. to say that it gives me a great deal of satisfaction to represent two outstanding shopping centers in California. It's an the ad. shopping hub of the San Gabriel Valley in West Arcadia and it's the Whittier Park Shopping an Center ad. in Whittier, California, because they are concrete expressions of the practical ideas beyond parody that built America. Watching these clips, you can see how new cultural norms set in. How certain things become pro-American, merely because they are anti-Soviet. As the film progresses, you can also see how the narrative stops being about responsibility, but about survival. About ways to beat the bomb and win over it. About accepting certain losses. And most importantly, creating a society with the necessary habits to survive the bomb. A prosperous society. A consuming society. A calm society. And always, always ready for the bomb to hit. And yes, this absolute unit is featured. There was a turtle by the name of Bert. Oh, bless you, worst PSA ever made. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and covered. Gotta love a little tiny duck quack on the word duck. Duck and covered. This useless yet child-friendly jingle must have been burned into the minds of kids for generations. Including mine. I first saw this movie in an 8th grade history class when we were talking about the Cold War. So, um... Thanks to my 8th grade history teacher for introducing me to the greatest metaphor for denial ever made. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. Duck and cover. a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. I really shouldn't have to tell you that ducking and covering will do little to nothing to protect you from an atomic blast. Bert the Turtle is the best encapsulation of this official American narrative. Because in this mindset, you are the only one who's going to protect yourself. Duck and cover. A fallout shelter in your basement will give adequate shielding from radioactive fallout. By the way, this PSA for buying a fallout shelter is intercut with a professor explaining why fallout shelters don't work. Even by Second World War bombs in Hamburg and Tokyo and in other cities showed that shelters became centers for incinerating or asphyxiating the people who are in them. Fallout shelters don't work. Thousands were spared the horrors of the Holocaust by taking refuge in enormous underground shelters known as vaults. Fallout shelters don't work. Fallout shelters don't work. Ah, uh, finally getting the message. Are you? See the gamification of the apocalypse. 
how people start looking for some god-awful bright sides. Half of Los Angeles is destroyed. Maybe 80, 90 percent of the people will be dead and there will be fewer mouths to feed. And those, those of us who will survive will have more water and food to divide up. And then how it just becomes part of everyday life. I was the only man on the ground. There was a 13 women and only one man in town. 13 women and only one man in town. You can see the mental misdirect by inciting the fear of a sin that we committed onto those of others. Funny then that all the fear is that it will be then done to us. No thoughts given to the victims of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, or to the new victims that they continue to create. They still tested bombs. They still prepared people for the idea of Judgment Day. We must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. and cover! That's the first thing to do. Duck and cover. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh, saith the Lord. Matthew 25, 13. The narrative that you get from watching all these government-issued public service announcements is that the thing that's being prioritized isn't safety, but comfort, stability, trying to assuage a potential panic. You can see how a new order sets in. Ground guards are kept on their toes by constant target practice, and they have orders to shoot to kill at any suspicious stranger. Yeah, that line stood out. All building an Atomic Age mythos. And the Atomic Age mythos, like all mythologies, imagined an ending. And that ending is the cleverest bit of editing. The filmmakers took all the footage they had, all the clips of 50s white Americana, cynical government propaganda, and military footage, and told the ridiculous story of what Americans were told would happen when the bombs fell. If there's an explosion, We'll wait about a minute after it's all over. Then we'll go upstairs and take a look around, see if it's all right for us to clean up. This is film editing at its best. Taking multiple clips and not just telling a story with them, but revealing the stories that the clips tell. Video essayists, take note. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? <laughs> So as I mentioned, I live in Queens, New York, about half a mile from Elmhurst Hospital. Um, I was actually hospitalized there in January with a um, pulmonary embolism, unrelated to COVID. Uh, I think it was unrelated to COVID. I mean, I'm negative. I got my test results the other day and uh, negative, yay. Then you keep hearing phrases like false negative. Anyway, pulmonary embolisms happen when blood clots form in your lungs, and we initially thought that I got one because I'd spent a lot of last year um, immobile. I hadn't been at all physically active. I spent a lot of time on the couch. And, um, oh yeah, my career is, um, you know, sitting down, watching movies, sitting down, editing video, sitting down, reading books, sitting down, taking notes. Just... All done sitting down. Definitely a risk factor for um, embolisms. Um, but I gotta say, I was really ready to get back in shape. I was going back to the gym, I was getting really excited about taking control over my body, and um, yeah, and uh, then the pandemic hit. And I didn't want to lose momentum. So, as I said, I pushed myself. I found ways to work out at home. I took those long walks. had cuff weights, had like 10 pounds on each leg, and it was great for like, you know, strength training, you know, great for cardio, and, you know, primarily just keep my blood flowing, just because, because what got me last time was immobility. I didn't move enough. That's the thing, I didn't move enough. I didn't move until I couldn't breathe. And I, um, so I just had to keep myself going. I just had to keep 
myself going and active through the pandemic just to keep my you know, my blood flowing because I really, really didn't want to find myself on a hospital bed again this year. Lost my physicians by their love, our grown cosmographers and I their map. Lie flat on this bed that by them may be shown that this my southwest discovery fret and febris by these straits to die. My joy that in these straits I see my west, for though the occurrence return to none, shall my west hurt me. As west and east in all flat maps, and I am one, are one, so death doth touch the resurrection. That was by the 17th century English metaphysical poet John Donne, from a poem called Hymn to God, My God, in My Sickness. When asked to comment upon the naming of the first atomic testing site, physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer cited this poem as the inspiration, though he may have been thinking of another Don poem. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but not breathe, shine, and seek to mend. I think that's how it goes. It's a poem of penitence, of making yourself humble before the three-person God, that is, the Trinity, the Christian Trinity, humble before the awesomeness of God. It was likely the poem that was on Oppenheimer's mind when he cited the works of Dunn as the inspiration for the name of the first nuclear test site. Trinity. Julius Robert Oppenheimer was an avid reader. In addition to being a quick study in physics, mechanics, chemistry, and about every other field he put his mind to, he could read in multiple languages. Famously, he read the Bhagavad Gita in the original Sanskrit. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So this is Oppenheimer's own translation. In fact, other translations I found seem more hopeful about that particular episode when Vishnu shows his true form to the prince. Some translations describe it as the radiance of a thousand suns, which might be the imagery that Oppenheimer was reaching for. As far as I can tell, that phrasing, now I am become death, is uniquely Oppenheimer. This famous interview is from 1965, 20 years after Trinity, and it doesn't appear in the Atomic Cafe. Oppenheimer only appears once, in this duck and cover based montage. It probably reflects well on Oppenheimer that he doesn't show up much here. Rafferty, Rafferty, and Loder were telling the story of normalized madness and Oppenheimer spent most of his time after Trinity trying to rein in atomic testing. But he was pushed out of the nuclear program when the government discovered that in addition to reading the Gita in the original Sanskrit, he also read Das Kapital in the original German. The architect of the bomb, who also rightly saw that the bomb should never be used, was pushed out of his own program for being too far left. testing continued. The film goes to the Bikini Islands, and rather mournfully shows the natives, oblivious as to what's about to happen, giving up their island for atomic testing. You basically watch an act of colonization on the Bikini Islands, as the entire islands are used for a testing ground. The islanders are a nomadic group, and are well pleased that the Yanks are going to add a little variety to their lives. Variety! The bomb will not start a chain reaction in the water, converting it all to gas and letting all the ships on all the oceans drop down to the bottom. It will not blow out the bottom of the sea and let all the water run down the hole. It will not destroy gravity. For a long time, atomic power seemed magical, able to do anything you want. Which is why American authors wrote worlds where radiation gives you not radiation poisoning, but superpowers. Is he strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. The Marvel motif of mysterious radiation giving people incredible strength is, uh, problematic? Then an accidental overdose of gamma radiation alters his body chemistry. And now when David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. 
these men actually were exposed to overdoses of radiation. Don't know if it was gamma. I had developed a, uh, a tumor in 04 when I went down and registered as an atomic vet. And it uh, turned out that the tumor was called swanoma tumor. It was caused by ionized radiation. I've had more than 30 take it happen. Their story isn't that well known, but the story of the atomic soldiers is a major chapter in this film. At some point in the weapons testing program, the US government apparently started to use live subjects. First, pigs. So, um... <clears throat> the pig nuking movie. I'm watching the pig nuking movie. And then they moved on to... live soldiers, deployed in tactical exercises, designed to take an area with ground troops immediately after nuking it. Which I should not have to tell you, is an utterly bugfuck insane thing to even plan what is wrong with people. It sounds made up. The U.S. did nuclear tactical exercises with live soldiers. It sounds insane. But they did it enough to make instructional films for it. And apparently, they did it enough to hire an actor to play a chaplain who said it was totally chill. What seems to be the trouble, soldier? You look a little bit worried. I use the word actor loosely. Actually, there's no need to be worried, as the Army has taken all of the necessary precautions to um, see that we're perfectly safe here. Oh my god! Sir, have you ever been out of one of these shots before? Yes, I've had the opportunity to see a number of the atomic tests. Oh, he's struggling so much with those words. Oh god. What's it like, Chaplain? We followed the instructions, which were to crouch down, uh, put our backs towards the, uh, the shot, and uh, bow our heads and cover our, our eyes. First of all, one sees a very, very bright light. I cannot begin to describe the light that came into my eye. You could literally just see every bone in there, everything. Even the guy's bones and back that was in front of you. I came across like this, it actually was totally x-ray. That's how bright the light was, to go from through the back of your head, through your eyes, and into your fingers, you're seeing your bones in your hand. Followed by a shock wave. Blast caught me in the face. It's a shrapnel in my face. It's mostly like uh, little glass beads that were melted glass beads. And then you hear the sound of the blast. The unforgettable sound, the, the roar. It roared, roared, and roared, and roared. And then it seems as though there's a minor earthquake. Clump of ground 10 yards this way, 15 yards this way, 10 yards back over here. And then you look up and you see the uh, fireball as, as it ascends up into the heaven. It's a wonderful sight to behold. This shot is not a special effect. This isn't a miniature, it's not a composite shot, definitely not CGI. Atom bombs were detonated for the purpose of training soldiers to fight in atomic wars. Like they were preparing for something. If it was done for science and and the availability to, to the rest of the human race to know that uh, that we don't need it. It's way too devastating. If you could just see the colors, if you could just hear it, hear it, not on the television or in a movie, but the actual thing, I, I think you would agree with me. And these tests were frequent. The U.S. would end up doing over a thousand. And yes, innocent people got radiation poisoning because of them. And the victims of radiation in these tests weren't just enlisted men or even American nationals. And not just the people of the Bikini Atoll. The film only hints at a major international scandal. At the time of the explosion, the tuna ship had been sailing far outside the designated safe area of a 75-mile radius. Three hours after the H-bomb had been detonated, a downpour of radioactive ash descended on the fortunate dragon and its crew of 23. None of them knew the nature of the deadly snow. 
On March 1, 1954, the tuna fishing boat Daigo Fukuryu Maru was irradiated by fallout from a nuclear test codenamed Castle Bravo. The 23 fishermen on board were all contaminated, along with their cargo. Fish brought back in their holes had been sold into markets all over Japan. A panic ensued. Midnight burials of recent catches in the vicinity of the H-bomb explosion took place all over Japan. In the film, it's mentioned in a cascade of headlines and buried in a montage of similar headlines. Another byproduct of the stupendous mid-Pacific blast unfolds in San Francisco, where tuna fish supposedly made radioactive during the test. Like so many shocking stories that hit the headlines and quickly get forgotten when the next shocking headline comes. Hot tea, anyone? That's not an invitation. It's a problem brewed for the coast The incident with the Daigo Fukuryu Maru was bigger news in Japan. In fact, it inspired a major cultural milestone. Months after the incident, Ishiro Honda began Japan's most famous fable about fears of a nuclear age with a mysterious flash sinking a fishing ship. I was looking forward to a visit with an old college friend, Dr. Serizawa. When Godzilla was exported to the United States, its distributors added an American protagonist played by Raymond Burr who began the film instead. While I was unaware of it at the time. It shifted the film's perspective to that of an outsider looking in. An act of cinematic colonization. The Atomic Cafe is focused on American culture, but if any nation on Earth has the right to talk about the dangers of the atom bomb, it's Japan. And the trauma of the bomb permeates 20th century Japanese culture. Godzilla is its grandest, most mythical expression. But it's been expressed in poetic ways as well. After all, the bomb shook not only Japan, but the world. French filmmaker Alain René made this classic of the new wave about the bomb. Hiroshima Mon Amour is the story of a parting love affair between two survivors of the war. One French, the other Japanese, covered in ashes. René had previously made a name for himself with Night in Fog, a poetic, horrifying documentary about the Holocaust. And this film's opening image tempts us to make that connection. France and Japan, united under ash. It was revolutionary in its use of flashback to tell its story, with its poetic combination of drama and documentary style. It's fitting then that it opens with a French voice saying that they saw the bombing of Hiroshima, and a Japanese voice saying that she saw nothing. It's fitting because we over-remember this French film about the bomb, and under-remember this Japanese film. Director Kaneto Shindo was born in Hiroshima Prefecture, and in 1952, he made this docudrama about a woman returning to her hometown. The Children of Hiroshima depicts the victims of the atom bomb how they were left blinded, or sterile, burned, and shunned from society. The victims of the bomb were given the name Hibakusha, in Japanese, bombed people. They were, and are, discriminated against due to ignorance about the effects of radiation poisoning. People thought it was contagious, and those who survived the bomb carried this mysterious new danger about them called radiation, and they were treated as if they were cursed. Shindo would be drawn to the Hibakusha. Shindo is best known for this horror film, Onibaba. It takes place in Japan's pre-modern past. It's the story of a mother and her daughter. The mother's lost her son in a war, and she finds a soldier wearing a demonic mask from no theater. She traps him, and finally unmasks him. And his scars are unmistakably those of a Hibakusha. Hibakusha 
And by the end of the film, the mother herself has worn the mask and can't remove it. And when she does, she has the same scars. Kaneto Shindo dwelled upon the physical scars of the victim, but mental scars were left as well. Take this horror film from 1977, Haosu. Its director, Nobuhiko Obayashi, was also born in Hiroshima Prefecture. When the bombs dropped, he was seven years old. It's a cult classic in the West because of its wild cartoonish horror and silly psychedelia. For just one example, there's a scene where a kid gets eaten alive by a piano. If you've seen Obayashi's house, what you probably remember is the silliness. What you might not recall is any serious engagement with the atomic bomb. But master video essayist Kogonada had a different take. A photo is taken, a flash of light, and then an explosion of the atomic bomb which is on the screen for just two seconds. And in one of the most affecting essays I've ever seen, he takes the film and puts it in the context of the nuclear age. Part of the absurdity of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima was its codename Little Boy. Of course, the greater absurdity was the scale of destruction that happened in an instant. A flash of light and a whole population gone. Kogonada, incidentally, is one of the only video essayists I can think of to actually go on to make a feature film. Check it out. It's called Columbus. It's wonderful. Time is warped. Reason is upended. Hell opened in a flash. Japanese popular culture, to Western eyes, has often seemed contradictory, fluctuating wildly between incredible serenity and insane ultraviolence. How easy Westerners forget that this was a trauma that we gave them. Take this anime, Barefoot Gen from 1983. The children are bouncy and happy, giant eyes like out of a Disney cartoon. Disney comic books were popular among Japanese children during the US occupation after the war. And Japan built an entire entertainment industry, building on the style of these foreign imports, coming from the same foreign power that introduced them to a new form of apocalypse. So for Western viewers, this scene might be incredibly shocking. Anime fans know what's about to come, but for those unfamiliar, consider this your only warning. Animation is a very powerful medium. Animation in Japan would often return to the imagery of the atom bomb, though rarely would it be this harrowing. American cinema wouldn't see anything like this until probably... James Cameron? I suppose I should point out that in this scene, Cameron had his actors duck and cover. Cameron was born in 1954, one of the great baby boomer directors. A generation who grew up being shown these films. Now, before the younger people viewing this respond with, OK, Boomer, wait. If you want to believe in generational theory and go with that framework of describing demographic cohorts, the people making these films would be part of the greatest generation. The audience of these films would be largely part of the silent generation. The baby boomers were the ones going under their desks in an air raid drill under orders from an animated turtle who cheerfully told them to be vigilant under constant threat of vaporization by people who hate the fact that they love freedom, whatever the hell that means. So what does that do to a generation? How did children raised in this atmosphere see the world? How might they perceive the world, having been told that it's near an end? And how might it feel to have spent a lifetime bracing to duck and cover for a bomb that never hit, preparing for an apocalypse that has yet to come? How do you view the government? Would you trust a government that you knew was preparing you for a fire next time that they would likely start? Would you believe in an apocalypse after that? Even when your apocalypse was preempted by another one? The big kaboom is, it's inevitable, I'm afraid. And coming sooner than you may think, if you catch my meaning. 
I'm filming this in late September of 2020, and here in Queens, it really does feel like the worst of it is over. I mean, I can hear people outside again. Workers, partiers, families. Uh, everyone has masks. Um, most people have masks. Uh, a lot of bars and restaurants are still in business, though they've moved outdoors, so it feels less like a series of shop fronts and more like an open bazaar. It's, it's very charming, honestly. And worrying, honestly. I mean, I keep mulling around phrases like second spike. So I haven't gone out dining. I've been to parks. You know, parks seem safe. Everyone's distant there. Um, I keep hearing some people say that it's safe to go outside, safe to be in small gatherings and with people who show no symptoms and things. But uh, hearing that safe to okay, safe to um, resume, resume normal activity. Um, but I haven't been able to ride a subway. I, I actually bought a subway card. I actually got onto the platform, and then I just saw how crowded the subway cars were, and I just thought about how many people were in there just breathing. And, you know, couldn't, I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't take, take the risk. It just seemed, that never used to seem risky before. I just couldn't take, take the risk. Risk is something the military doesn't have a corner on. Occupational hazards are accepted in a matter-of-fact manner in civilian life. Risk is part of the pattern of daily routine. La, 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 la. There's been a lot of people that died. I would venture to say that there was more people killed in the testing, not immediately, but over the 50-year period of our, our silence, that there were probably more people killed from the testing than there was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It haunts me to think of what I had witnessed and not realized at the time the import of what we were doing at the time, actually serving as guinea pigs. We were just it's like an experiment animal to use in a lab. There are only three things to think about. Blast, heat, and radiation. Radiation, this is the one new effect obtained by the use of an atomic weapon. Truthfully, it's the least important of the three effects, as far as the soldier on the ground is concerned. You can't see radiation, feel it, smell it, or taste it. Film badges and dosimeters issued to you enable the radiological safety monitor in your unit to read the amount of your exposure. The radiation level may be high, but if you follow orders, you'll be moved out in time to avoid sickness. Finally, if you receive enough gamma radiation to cause sterility or severe sickness, you'll be killed by blast, flying debris, or heat anyway. Well, they knew everything that was gonna happen and what danger was involved in it. They're just hoping you all die before they have to do anything. It's the fallacy of devoting 85% of one's worrying capacity to an agent that constitutes only about 15% of an atomic bomb's destroying potential. And that's unsound. Doesn't fit. <sighs> that's a horrible word, isn't it? Normalize. I've heard it a lot. Normalize being sad. Normalize being depressed. Normalize canceling appointments. Normalize saying you can't work because you're too sad because Everyone's feeling it. I've had to normalize a lot of things this last year. I've normalized wearing a mask because, you know, I know it protects other people and it keeps me safe. It keeps everyone safer. And also wearing a mask makes it easier to cry in public. What trauma might they carry? What fears might they hold on to? What might they expect of the world after being told it could end at any moment? 
What do you do when you're raised with that fear? Normalize it, I suppose. Normalize that fear. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it take over your lives. Don't let that happen. We have the greatest country in the world. We're going back. We're going back to work. We're going to be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. A third surge as the United States reports more than 51,000 new cases a day. And it feels like we've normalized the deaths, too. We've passed the 200,000 mark in this country. 200,000 deaths in this country. That's high. That's the highest in the world. And if we're insisting on resuming now dangerous activities because we expect society to behave a certain way and we have certain cultural norms to uphold and certain structures that need support and just, and we need to keep going no matter the risk. Keep going no matter the risk. Keep going no matter the risk. So, um, it just sounds really disturbingly familiar. Of course, we now know from audio recorded statements that the severity of the coronavirus is deliberately downplayed in order to prevent a panic. And obviously there was a panic. Uh, I'm panicking. I have not st stopped panicking since March. Unless, of course, the president meant panic in an economic sense, which, um, he would, in which case he would have been using the language of the stock market and not psychology. So, do the people that we've chosen to be our leaders care if we live or die? Did they ever? Enough exposure to radiation will cause loss of hair. The treatment, if you'd insist, would be symptomatic. A toupee. They're recommending that if you have radiation poisoning, you should get a toupee. Because, oh God. In this view, the fallout casualties, if any, will be seen as those of unidentified soldiers in the service of humanity. Unknown soldiers in a war which has not struck. And look. <laughs> I normalized never wanting to go on a subway again. how much more we have developed scientifically than we are capable of handling emotionally and intellectually. The Atomic Cafe is a documentary collecting American propaganda and revealing its hollowness. The film shows the failures of American leadership to acknowledge the full destructive power of the atom bomb. And because of that failure, that overwhelming burst of ignorance left the nation traumatized. Because in that vacuum of information, all kinds of things can be normalized. What sins will we blame on the virus? What will we do that will then say had to be done? What terrible peace will we achieve? What will we normalize? I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. I think I got in my own feelings when I was filming. But I've been in my own feelings for a long time. Probably since March. No, before that. Expecting myself to get the disease. Or the people that I love to get it. Just knowing that so little is being done to prevent its spread. I think that's why I wanted to talk about this film. Because these messages are very old and they're just as fucking useless. Um, okay, so I'm filming this, um, several days, actually 
like over 10 days after filming the rest of the video because I had to do a quick update um, on my situation because um, remember how early in the video I said that I didn't want to end up in a hospital again? Um, I wound up in a hospital again. Uh, the uh, mental, for the mental ward. Um, this year has been a special hell for me, as it has been a special hell for everyone. Dealt with a lot of really deep-seated issues in um, a really, really supportive environment. And I'm really glad for the, for the time off, for the time not working. But it did give me a lot of time to reflect on how much of a toll that this year has really taken. I'm going to say that as if my mental issues are unique, and they're not. I know they're not. That's what makes it all so terrible, because I don't know how deep this trauma will run, how deep the trauma of this year will run. I want to stress that I am in a safe place, that I am with someone who loves me and cares about me, and that I have people who care about me who um, are helping me do a lot of hard work to um, deal with a lot of deep-seated mental issues that I have been dealing with my entire life. And this year has been hard as it has been on a lot of people, on most people, on everyone. But one thing that I've been thinking about is apocalypse, the word apocalypse. I mean, I like etymology. I like knowing the origin, origins of words because it reminds me that these concepts were once new and that maybe the original meaning has been lost. Apocalypse, as it turns out, is just Greek for Revelation. You know, the book of Revelation, Apocalypse in Greek. And Apocalypse is simply just a revealing of how we could end. It's revealed in near-death experiences, revealed in national tragedies, it's revealed. Are you filming? Yes, I am filming right now. The camera is running. My fiance. She's helped me through a lot of things. And again, I want to stress that I am in a safe place and that I do have someone who cares about me, looking after me. I've always been fascinated by post-apocalyptic fiction, because I've always found them hopeful, because they remind us that the apocalypse is not an ending. It's a reveal of how we can end. And there's always, always survivors. Life still goes on, even though it's strange and new and... um graphically buggy. That was a fallout joke. Life goes on. The world goes on. This too will be past. <laughs> Something will be lost. Maybe our souls, whatever that means. Maybe our innocence, maybe our sense of security is lost through that terrible revelation. But ultimately, you live through it because you have to. And that's what I plan on doing. Because I have to. Because I want to. I'll live.
the subway's going by. I still haven't used it. Still haven't used the subway since March. I guess that's just the new post-apocalyptic world we live in. So I know what I can do, and I know what I will do. I'll live through it. I'll live through it. I'll live through it. And so can you, because I believe there is a world after this. And in the meantime, I'll duck, I'll cover, and I'll think about all the ways that our world is already post-apocalyptic.
That's the story. Don't worry about yourselves. As far as the test is concerned, you'll be okay. <laughs>